Good morning. So the slides you're going to see here are a product of several people. I'm going to give them credit now. Craig Bargfried, Sean Blazing, Joe Drehas, Jared Elm, Tina Greenfield, John Hart, Brad Osborne. And uh, Joe and Jared are right up here. They're interns in our office, and they're the ones that also made up, put the slides together for me. Thanks, guys. The Department of Transportation has a lot of resources available for ETO events. There are a lot of field-based resources. We're going to talk about some of that. To put it in perspective, the state of Iowa has a lot of roads, and we have a lot of roads because we have a lot of good land that, was, uh, that we need to access for agricultural purposes. But out of that, we have a big infrastructure, right? City, county, and state infrastructure. A lot of bridges. If you take a look, though, at where the people actually drive most of the miles, it's on the DOT system. So we've got 19 billion vehicle miles traveled in a year on our, on our DOT system. And that actually translates a lot of responsibility for us. One of the things that, uh, the, one of the things that we put together is something called an area, area of responsibility. So we have 109 maintenance garages in the state. Each one has a specific assigned area of responsibility. And this is useful to know not only just for, for maintenance, but for people that want to get a hold of someone, a supervisor who's responsible for a certain area of the state to talk about some other aspect of it. So just as an example here, here's Rock Valley, and even though these colors aren't the greatest to show up here, Rock Valley shop is here, and that shop is responsible for those, those green sections of the road and so on around the state. So this map is available on the portal, the Highway Division portal. Uh, it takes a lot of work. The, the, the districts change boundaries, they, uh, re responsibility boundaries. We change the map. The field is organized from a supervisory point of view. The 109 shops are organized into circles, maintenance circles. So even though we have 109 shops, we have 52 supervisors in charge of those 109 shops. So just for example, the bigger shops are solo, like Ames. You slide over to Boone, here's Jeff Vanderschweig, who's responsible for two shops. Slide over a little bit more, Carroll area, here's a circle with three shops. And uh, that's a lot of responsibility. It's a lot of moving around, a lot of folks to, to, be, to be watching. And this was put together just so that uh, people could see what the field organization is about, about the shops. As far as field staffing and, resource, and where the resources actually are within the department and within the field, uh, the Department of Ch the, the Highway Division has got 2,014 people. Of those 2,014, we have 1,500 of them available in the field, so three-fourths of the Highway Division is located in the districts. And about half the Highway Division, 1,102 people, are in field maintenance. So you see the composition here, but in, in a broader way, uh, materials folks, construction folks, even district office folks are available to respond to ETO events and help assist maintenance field staff in doing things. Uh, all the maintenance staff that we have have commercial driver's licenses which are required to move uh, vehicles around on a road. Other people who don't have CDLs can, can do jobs in maintenance that don't require a license, like operate a loader, front end loader, as one example. I think we're not going to spend a lot of time here. We, every, each one of you has a handout with these slides on it, and this just gives an overview of how the districts are organized. As far as the 109 shops, uh, this shows where they are and how many people are in them. And uh, the biggest shop in the state has 32 people in it. It's over in Davenport. Some of the Des Moines metro area shops have high 20s in them. These are all resources available. We have, the resources in the field have wheels. We move them around as needed. For example, when we had our real severe flooding in 2008 in districts 2 and 6 and 5, Western Iowa mobilized and moved east. And when you mobilize vehicles, mobilize trucks and move them, you also mobilize supervisors to take care of the people that are driving the truck. And you, super, and you organize mechanics. You take supplies along with you to take care of your vehicles, and it's actually kind of a, a major operation. And uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of practice in doing this. 
This is a document that we publish yearly and update yearly. It just shows the way the resources that are distributed around the field. You've got it on your handout. So for each district, resources that are available. Speaking of resources, so when the, when the, highway, when the Iowa State Highway Commission started in 1914, the counties were taking care of the roads. And that was that way until about 1927 when we got really started to get modern, we put gravel on roads and the counties couldn't quite, couldn't quite handle that. So we actually put our own maintenance resources uh, in place at that time. And this was a modern shop that we built about 130 of between 1927 and 1937. It was modern in 1927. We still have some of these left. Here's a distribution scatter, scatter plot of when we built our shops and how many we have. And you can see we have a lot of them in, in different, scattered around in different eras. And recently we've been replacing one maintenance garage a year. And uh, so we've been kind of struggling to, to, to keep up to speed on some of the older, keep the older, older infrastructure still functional. And here's an example of, of that. So here's a 1927 to 37 vintage building. But here's the same thing. This is Dubuque. This thing's operational yet. So here's the original shop right here. Here's an addition, two stalls that were put on. Here's a, an addition that was put on for the supervisor's office and so on. Here's more stalls added out the back. Here's cold storage. Here's a place to store salt. Uh, this is an operational garage operating with a building that's 80 plus years old is a, is a major piece of it. It's just, it's, it's complicated and difficult. And the, I think Highway Division has an interest in replacing this, this shop and is discussing this as a, as a reasonably high priority for one of our next replacements. We got newer, 1961 vintage. We built a number of these from 56 to 61 into the, into the early 60s. We still got these available. This one's still operational. We got newer yet, when we started building interstate, this is our interstate style shop, mechanics bays in the front, supervisor's office with garage bays going out the back. And this is our newer, newer style shop. Uh, these are made of uh, precast elements that are tipped up and uh, put in place. And these are nice shops. We've been building these since about 1985. We have equipment resources available. So oftentimes things have to be moved. This is a picture of a friend and loader, for example. But here's, here's the equipment that we have, uh, some of the equipment we have available. We have trucks. We have a lot of trucks. We have uh, trucks that are mostly medium duty. That's a one axle truck in the back, one axle in the back, and tandems, heavy duties. And you can see we have uh, around 900 of those. Uh, putting all of our trucks together, we have a little over 1,000 trucks. They have wheels, they can move, and that's appropriate. We have semis to haul things around that uh, aren't able to move so easily. We have motor graders. And, but you can see each one of these has a cost. We run our trucks for about 18 years and replace them, depreciate them out, if you will. Motor graders, uh, these are getting to be well over 20 years old. They still work. Anyway, we have a wide variety of equipment available for events. And uh, here's, a, here's a truck. And this is a tandem truck. It's a tandem truck because it's got two uh, sets of axles in the back. This one has, uh, this is where the hydraulic fluids is, is in the truck, the fuel, snow plows hung off the front here. This has an underbody plow on it. It has a place to spread, uh, has a, a spinner on the back to spread salt and sand. It's a dump body can tip up. This thing right here is, has, a, has a wing that's hung off the right-hand side of the truck to help uh, push snow further out. That's not your grandfather's truck on the inside, is it? So that's what the driver sees. That's just part of what the driver sees. And uh, th there's a lot going on. In addition to driving the truck, staying on the road, not being able to see where you're going sometimes, being slippery, and operating uh, the equipment that the truck has on it. There's some, there's some complexity to that. We also have radios in each one of our truck and each one of our supervisor's vehicles. That's how we communicate. We have our own radio system because we all know that the cell system can become unstable with, under high traffic use. And some states have, uh, a couple of states I can think of have, that who did not have uh, viable radio systems have got themselves jammed up over not being able to, to communicate in emergency events. As far as floods, 
trucks have wheels, we move them around as needed. Winter operations, same kind of thing. The bottom two pictures are snow blowers. We have 12 snow blowers. They're about a half million dollars a piece. And it's gonna sound a little silly, but I just saying we didn't have to operate them any more than we have to, because it means we got a lot of snow if you have to operate them, right? Uh, snow blowers are sometimes used, and we operate off of our own state highway system under governor gubernatorial proclamations at times. So we have the 115,000 miles of road with a gubernatorial proclamation. We may have to operate on any, any of that or a lot of it. So our snow blowers practically lived on county roads in District 4 a couple years ago because of all the winter uh, events they had and it took snow blower to clear out. Front end loader, we're always having to pick stuff up and move it. Loaders do that. And while I'm talking about loaders and trucks, uh, if you're ever on the field around equipment, trucks are dangerous, particularly backing up trucks are dangerous, be aware of that. Loaders are dangerous going any direction. So I've had four of my employees killed, three of them by being backed over by a truck, and one of them being backed over or run over by a loader. It's just, be aware, if you're in the field, it's great to go to the field, be aware that it can be dangerous, particularly around equipment. So, more use uh, for events and how we use our equipment. We have other equipment. Sometimes it's nice to dig, dig things, move things. Other equipment. So this is a truck on top of a bridge with a snooper inspection unit on it. And this happens to have a bucket on it. You can also have a platform out here. And if you're ever on one of those, it's always moving. You're moving sideways, up and down, forward. It's not stable. But you try not to think about that when you're out there. Knuckle boom truck, so this is just a regular snow, a little snow plow like truck without a dump body on it. Has a hydraulically operated arm, can lift things, move things, you can drill holes. Another knuckle boom truck. This is a little different type of truck, same principle, it's a high reach truck. We have other types of equipment that we can make available, motor grader. It's got four wheels that drive in the back, a blade underneath. Uh, we can put uh, snow plows on the front, and they are used in the winter. Put snow blowers on the front, in at least one case I'm aware of. So here's an example of a tractor, just a regular, like an old farm tractor. It's got a PTO on it, power takeoff, and it's driving a pump. I think it's a US 30. Does that look right, Scott? Yeah. Okay. And so what District 1 is doing here is trying to keep this road open by pumping water that's gotten into the median probably from culvert pipes from overtopping and shutting the road off. So sucking the water in, pumping the water out. Another piece of equipment, this is a trap bag again, so we're putting material in the trap bag. Here's a motor grader putting up a windrow of material, it looks like, trying to keep this water off of that road. We have supervisor's trucks. Uh, each one of our supervisors has a truck. And Sean, do you have something that you want to talk about here that would be useful for us? Okay. So uh, our supervisors need to get around. We have radios in these in these two. And Sean, you want to talk about a little bit about the iPads? Sure. Um, what's that? I have a mic on. In uh, 2013, so last year. Uh, we used some end of year money to be able to purchase iPads for the field staff. Uh, their primary use in the winter is for road condition reporting and so we've got uh, links on the devices that take them to the things that they need to have access to. They also have a lot of weather, I think they've got like six different weather apps on them now. <laughs> I was giggling the other day when I was looking. And so they can see live weather while they're out in the trucks in the field. Um, they're also using them for asset inventory and inspection and a wide variety of other things. But it basically it gives them a mobile workforce so that they can go out and be in the trucks. The supervisors are using them pretty heavily uh, to be able to interact with things out in the field. And this is, picture is an example where they had their weather radar up and they were looking to see. They, they like to know what's coming and what's already gone past. They can see that while they're out in the field. And it, a lot of the weather radar ones will put a blue dot where you are so they can have some context when they're out in the field. Mm -hmm. So we're in the process of bringing in 50 more units for them to distribute. The goal is that the bigger garages will have more devices. And the goal, goal is also that every garage will have a device. Right now, not all of them do have them. So uh, as we continue to 
push the devices out in the field and make them available for the field staff. Uh, it, it also is great for an emergency event because now with some of the tools like Eric was showing, we can push out maps to them out in the field. We can push out um, data collection forms and things like that where they can actually go out and collect information in the field. And we can do that pretty quickly now. So uh, that's one of the advantages of leveraging some of the new technologies. So the highway division has recognized the power of being able to have situationally appropriate information wherever you are at, at a point in time. You know, so Eric showed some information. He showed he showed lidar. He showed various other things. So it's it's just so powerful when you if you're a field based person to be able to be on your in your on your road, stop on a shoulder in a safe way, pull up information about this spot if you're doing some troubleshooting. And we're going to get to the place eventually where you can pull up road plans. We can pull up any kind of information we might need to work with a citizen or work with our own staff to solve an issue that we face on, on the road. And that's really what a lot of the field does, in my, in my opinion, when I've been in the field, you interface with the public there. And the more information we have in real time available when we visit with the public or solve situations, uh, it's real powerful. Something else we've gotten into uh, the last no, 10 years, or, is the ability to have and display appropriate messages in the field on a fixed changeable message sign system or on unmovable changeable message signs. So this thing's sitting on a trailer, it's hidden by the weeds here. There are about 25,000 a piece that it can be remotely communicated with by the op center. They can, they move and uh, they're just have proven to be very, very useful and I think they're a great boon to, the, to public safety from as I see it. Something else we have is the road weather information system. So this is a tower. It's got an anemometer on it. It's got side fire radar. It's got a pan tilt zoom camera. It's got connected to sensors. And we have a system of these around the state. And Tina Greenfield in the Office of Maintenance is uh, in charge of helping keep this system up to speed. It furnishes information for area supervisors, for maintenance, for whoever wants to, wants to access the information. And it's available. I've got a friend who's a school superintendent who uses one near his school to determine whether or not he should have uh, kids driving to school in the morning and winter. So a lot of information here. We uh, have a great investment here that's had a big return, in my opinion. Same picture, but there's also something called the uh, uh, same kind of thing available in air for airports and it's called the AWAS system. We have a, a program, uh, a site, that brings a lot of this information together. So if you notice over here, you can click on RWIS or AWAS, and you can click on air temperature, road temperature, and do various other things, and display what the system is returning. And you can track weather moving across the state that way, verify uh, what, the weather, what the weather folks are telling us, and it's a very powerful, useful system. Something we've gotten into here recently is a GPS AVL. So we have each one of our snowplow trucks equipped such that we know where it is and what it's doing. And that is so powerful. Uh, we know where the resources are. DEs, for example, or our district maintenance manager can get on our system here and see where their equipment is, and particularly if it comes to relocate resources quickly, you can spot what your closest resource is. Uh, something else we have here, we have a Whopper site. Sean, you want to talk about that a little bit? Our Whopper site? Um, the Whopper site is just similar to what Eric was showing. It's on the same technology as the stuff that Eric was showing, and it, it basically allows a live feed showing where the trucks are. They have different icons and different colors depending on um, how fast they're going, what the weather temperature is, whether or not they're putting stuff out the back, whether or not their plows up and down. Um, and you can click on each of the individual trucks on the site and see information about that truck. You can also, I think we had the Plow cams hooked up, right? So we had, we have plow cams on 200 of our trucks. We're expanding to 400 for the next uh, winter season. And what that allows um, people to see is that when we're having a weather event, they activate the, the cameras on the front dashes of the trucks. And that actually gives you a live feed of what's actually happening in front of the truck. So you can see 
what's going on on the roadway while they're driving down it. So, and you can access both of them from the Whopper site. So for ETO events, you know, this could just as well be a truck sitting somewhere looking at flooding, taking pictures of, a, of, a situ of an area that you uh, would like to keep up to speed on. And the information would be made available. We also, the iPhones can also stream. We can take streaming video of the phones, that, uh, 400 phones that we have. Powerful tool.